So of course, when you have alloying elements, what common alloying elements are used in steel? Nickel, chromium, sometimes copper. So these are used to increase the corrosion resistance of the steel. Okay. So what happens is the, these may actually shift the temperature at which eutectite transformation actually occurs and the carbon concentration also may shift a little bit when you have some alloying elements also built into this system. So as I said, we want to look at the phases that form at low percentages of carbon. So we need to look at hypo eutectoid steel that means less than eutectoid. Okay. So we are looking at carbon contents in this range between 0 and 0 0.77 percent and what happens here is this is gamma phase now will convert not only to the perlite phase, it will also convert to the ferrite phase. So if you take any composition in between 0 and 0 0.77 and if you come down this temperature axis, you have now the possibility of forming either a completely eutectoid transformation of gamma to alpha plus heavy 3 C or you can form something called direct alpha phase or pro eutectoid alpha phase. Okay. Basically this alpha that is marked in blue is the alpha phase that is formed even before the temperature of 727 degrees is reached. What happens after 727 is that whatever remaining gamma is there gets converted to what will happen to gamma? It will get converted to what after 727? Perlite, eutectoid phase of perlite, eutectoid transformation of gamma will take place at 727. But even before temperatures of 727, you also have the alpha phase crystallizing, forming out. So the resultant steel that you have at low carbon contents has more of the what phase, alpha or cementite? If you are somewhere here and you are coming down the temperature axis, that means the proportion of this phase is a lot more than this phase. If you are here coming down the axis, the proportion of this phase is a lot more than the other phase. So if you are to the left, the proportion of the alpha phase is more and cementite phase is less. So your pro eutectoid or hypo eutectoid steel will have a large characteristic of alpha. That means the primary characteristic in this material will be strength or ductility? <laughs> ductility, alpha phase is more ductile. So there will be a lot of ductility in the steel. Whereas if you move away from the hypo eutectoid phase towards the hyper eutectoid phases, which is on the other side, you will get more of cementite, you will start forming more of cementite phase and because of that you will get more strength but less ductility. Okay, anyway, but we are not concerned with the hypo eutectoid transformation. Now it does not end with that, we know that steel is taken to a molten state, I mean formed in a molten state and then cooled to the solid. The time over which this transformation takes place determines actually what the microstructure which is forming. Okay. But earlier we saw that there is a eutectoid transformation, that assumes one important thing that there is equilibrium during this transition. That means you have infinite time over which this transformation is happening play, uh, from above 727 to below 727, but that is not really the case. Okay. In reality, time plays a major role in the kind of microstructure that you actually get with steel. So without getting too much into the details, what happens with stages of time is that you can start forming different types of phases. If the time is very large, that means if you have a lot of time over which this transformation occurs, obviously all the austenite will get converted to perlite. But in reality that does not happen, so you need to study the isothermal transformation curves or time temperature transformation curves to realize what is going to happen to this steel when we actually cool it down from the molten state or from the gamma state. Okay. In reality you can have several different phases forming, you have perlite, you can have bainite phase forming, you can get martensitic phase and spheroidite phase. In our case, we are most concerned with perlite and martensite. Now martensite is very interesting because it is formed when you suddenly cool the steel from austenite to room temperature. How do you suddenly cool something? You can just quench the material, throw water on it, it becomes cool immediately. Okay. So this immediate cooling transforms steel into martensitic phase.
and that is a very hard and strong phase. Martensite is a very hard and strong phase. Whereas if you have a very slow cooling, you will start forming the other phases, perlite, bainite and so on. Okay. So, but mainly we are concerned with perlite and martensitic phases because it will come later when we deal with the structure of your quenched self-tempered steel right? or QST which we otherwise wrongly call as TMT steel. Okay. So, how the composition affects mechanical properties, austenite on slow cooling can form perlite, in moderate cooling it forms bainite and rapid quenching it forms martensite. Right. So, if you go from perlite towards martensite, your ductility reduces but strength increases. Okay. But what you can do is take the martensite and reheat it and then cool it slowly. You do not reheat to above austenitic temperature because then that will convert to austenite again. So, you heat it to below austenitic temperature and this heating what it does is it gets rid of the internal strains. So, when you cool it back again the material will still be strong, but it would have lost some of its brittleness, it will become a lot more ductile. So, that is called tempering, it is a heat treatment process tempering where you heat the martensite to a lower temperature than the as austenite transformation temperature and then cool it back slowly. But when one thing which is very clear is that the type of microstructure has a major effect on the properties. So, again there are different types of heat treatments for steel, uh, we do not need to go through the details here, you have annealing, you have normalizing and of course, in the case of martensite you have this uh, tempering process which we just saw. Again within annealing itself we got different types of uh, processes which need to be studied in detail to really figure out what ultimately we get in the steel. But as civil engineers most of the time we really do not look at the process of manufacture of steel. We deal with the material as it is obtained from the factory which is manufacturing the steel. Right? With cement concrete and asphalt concrete till the last step of the process we are involved, but as far as steel is concerned civil engineers have very little understanding of what this material is. But then when we start dealing with issues of service, when we deal with premature failures of structures, we need to really get into the processing of steel to understand what could have happened that led to this behavior during the performance. Especially when we deal with things like corrosion, a lot of interesting aspects actually come about because of that. So, structural steel as I said has very low carbon content, typically we are talking about less than 0.2, but general range is 0.5 to 0.27 percent. We generally alloy it with some small amounts of copper and manganese to introduce a little bit higher corrosion resistance. Several standard shapes are used I shape, H, uh, channel, angle right all those are used for different types of steel frames. Okay. And the most commonly used grade is 250 mega Pascals. What is the strength? The yield strength. Okay, I'm sorry about this P being small. It should be capital, 250 mega Pascals, which is structural carbon steel. Okay, or we otherwise know it as mild steel. 250 mega Pascals is the yield strength of mild steel. Reinforcing steel, on the other hand, uh, you can either get plain bars. Of course, you don't get any plain bars these days. Mostly, you get deformed bars, and uh, you also get bars primarily which have ribs on them. Okay. The ribs are there to promote what? The bonding with the concrete. Okay. Commonly in India we have 3 grades 415, 500 and 550. Now in the past people were producing steel with cold twisting which were also known as CTD bars or HYSD bars okay. which again I have put in the next slide. So, HYSD or CTD bars are obtained from cold twisting of the mild steel. So, if you remember your mild steel stress strain diagram, right? what happens here? You have initial linear portion and then you have a yielding and then you have strain hardening and then you have failure breaking happening at a, at a stress which is lower than the ultimate stress. So, you have sigma ultimate here and you have sigma yielding here and this is what we are looking at as 250. So, how does cold twisting lead to the formation of reinforcing steel? We are not changing the material, we are only using mild steel 
we are cold twisting it to form reinforcing steel. So, what does cold twisting do? Yeah, the plastic region will be removed. Exactly. So, what we do is in cold twisting, we are taking it through this initial phase, taking a, taking the stress up to this location and then unloading. When we unload, the material unloads parallel to the initial linear phase, right? And when we reload this material, what happens now? It follows this path. So, that means it is reaching a higher level of stress, but it does not have any more well defined yield point because it is lost this plastic deformation. Okay. So, it now goes directly to the strain hardening region and then we measure the yield stress with the 0.2 percent offset method. Right? We draw a line parallel and we this becomes our new yield stress. So, that is called the 0.2 percent offset method. That is why we call this yield strength as what stress? Proof stress. And that is why from the same mild steel which has a yield strength of 250 mega Pascals, we are able to obtain grades of 415. Okay. But for the higher grades 550 and all, we go for TMT technology or QST which is the correct name. So, TMT which is otherwise written as thermomechanically treated bars were introduced in India in the 1990s. Okay. So, here what happens is these bars actually any bar goes through a thermomechanical process. So, actually this is not the correct name. The correct name is QST or quenched self tempered bar. Okay. Thermomechanical process means any bar goes through a temperature treatment and some mechanical treatment right? that happens for anything. So, what is done in this case is that these bars are passed through cooling tubes for controlled quenching. So, as soon as the molten state bars, I mean the bars are cooling from the molten state, you cool them very fast, quench them so that you get an outer surface of martensite. Okay. And then the inner part of the uh, core of the bar then cools very slowly. And when it cools, it reheats this martensitic outer part and causes it to get tempered. So, that is an interesting technology because now what we have is we have an inner core of the soft and ductile perlite material and an outer layer of the hard and probably not as brittle because now it is got tempered right. It is it's the martensitic exterior. So, you get good strength, good ductility and one more very important part of TMT is also get good corrosion resistance. And why is the corrosion resistance better? Because the martensite phase is less prone to corrosion as compared to the perlite phase. Again, now you see the importance of microstructure, right? The types of phases that form because of processing have a direct connotation with the performance of your system. So, here we are dealing with strength, ductility, which are imparted to this bar by the inner core, which is ductile and the outer layer which is hard and strong and then you also get good corrosion resistance because the phase in the outer layer is less prone to corrosion problems as compared to the inner phase that is perlite. So, again the importance of microstructure here can definitely be understood. Of course, you also have uh, structural requirements for steel. You need obviously the tensile strength which is the primary characteristic as a reinforcing material you need to have a good bond with the concrete because of which the ribs are introduced into the steel and ductility is important because we need sufficient level of ductility to get the performance of the structure that we desire. 10 percent elongation is usually considered adequate, but typical steels will give you close to 20 percent elongation. Carbon content has to be controlled because the higher the carbon content, the lesser the elongation. Okay. Bendability again is important because when you bend, you should not start causing failure at the bends. Weldability also is affected by the carbon content. When you have high carbon content bars, they are unsuitable for welding. Why do you need welding? You need to extend the length of these sections, so welding has to be done. And of course, other important characteristics include fatigue strength, corrosion resistance and finally, fire resistance. Again, fire resistance goes down with carbon content. The higher the carbon, the lower the fire resistance. Okay. All right, so Moving on to the final segment of this uh, initial understanding of the structure of materials just to get you some overview and uh, 
help you remember the concepts that you've learned in the past. So we'll not learn a lot about polymers and plastics because primarily our concern is with, is with asphalt, but a lot of the basics of asphalt are in understanding polymer and plastic. So polymers and plastics, polymer simply means that it is a combination of many repeating units called <coughs> mers or monomers. So many monomers together make a polymer. So these are some examples of polymer you've come across in standard textbooks, polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, polypropylene and so on. The structure of the polymer is defined by how these links are connected, okay. In certain polymers like linear polymers, these links or long chains of individual monomeric units may not be connected through a strong bond but only through a secondary bond. What are some examples of secondary bonding? Secondary bonding includes van der Waals forces, you can have hydrogen bonding and so on, so that is secondary bonding, okay. It is not a primary bond between the links, okay. But in certain cases, the same linear structure can also have branches, but still they are not bonded with primary bonds, they are only bonded with secondary bonds. If you go to a little bit more organized structure, you have these cross links which start appearing between the main links main chains that is called a cross link structure and in a greater degree of order you have the polymer network which is having a proper repeated orderly arrangement. So now the direction of increasing strength obviously leads it from this loosely defined structure to a well regulated and created structure. So when you go from a linear to a network structure your strength is rapidly increasing. What about crystallinity? How do you define crystallinity? Crystalline means it has some ordered arrangement. So when you go from linear to network, your crystallinity also increases. What about temperature susceptibility of the polymer? The properties of the polymer will change a lot when you have what type of structure? Easy. What is going to happen? When you increase the temperature, which sort of polymer is starting to flow a lot more than others? No, here amongst these structures, the linear and branched, these are the polymers that will be ex expected to get deformed significantly when you change temperatures. These will be affected a lot more by temperature and rate of loading as compared to the cross-linked and network structures. So once again, what we want to emphasize here is that the structure of the material controls its characteristics and how do you understand the structure? You understand it by characterization. So again, uh, there are several indicators of the performance of the polymer. You have molecular weight which indicates how many links are connected together. Tensile strength increases with the molecular weight and again percentage of crystallinity is defining the material that is crystalline. So if you look at, at the polymer under the microscope and recognize how many of the regions are actually looking ordered that is basically your degree of crystallinity in the polymer. Tensile strength and modulus of elasticity increase with the degree of crystallinity. Now similar to metals in plastics also you can do heat treatments like annealing and annealing basically is slow heating and slow cooling and that slow heating and cooling process in polymers also will tend to increase the extent of order that you have in the structure. So annealing will actually lead to an increase in the strength and modulus of the polymer also. Now important characteristic to understand is how does the mechanical response change with different types of structures, okay. So in the case of reticulated or networked structures, the order is so good that you ultimately end up simply getting a breakage of the bonds and that leads to a brittle failure, okay. But interestingly, when you have the secondary bonding or semi-crystalline materials, you have an interesting uh, load carrying behavior here. You have an initial increase in the load. You have onset of necking, which basically is when you start aligning these irregularly ordered chains and they start straightening up and then ultimately these uh, bunches of chains start slipping past each other. So it is almost akin to what you see in the yielding of metals, right? It is almost like the yielding of metals process. Now here you can 
think of this as something similar to that of a very high strength metal which undergoes a brittle transformation. But here you are dealing with ductile metals. So, there is arrangement and then rearrangement and then finally slippage of the material past each other. Of course, uh, you do not get to see an increase in the order in metals. In plastics and polymers that is the in, in interesting part that you actually see an increase in the extent of order with more loading in the process. Right? In the beginning there is a lot of jumbling up of the amorphous or, or semi crystalline regions, but when you increase the load these become start, start becoming straightened up and that increases the level of order in the polymers. Now, there some polymers tend to disobey the entropy law. Right? When we say that when we do work on the system the entropy always increases. Here in the case of polymers a reverse is happening. Some work in the system is actually decreasing the level of entropy increasing the order in the system. Again similar to cold working in metals you also have something called drawing. Okay? So, just like in metals if you do this process even before the loading starts. So, you take the polymer and stretch it what will happen all these amorphous regions will straighten up and then your loading will again directly go into this later phase. So, your ultimate failure may actually be at a higher load as, as opposed to your initial system okay. just like your cold working of steel the reworking of the plastic by drawing can actually lead to a higher strength. Okay, again there is a lot of issues that deals with heat treatment followed by drawing or drawing followed by heat treatment and that can lead to different bunches of characteristics inside. And there can also be another case called elastomeric case just like what we see in rubber. In rubber what happens at, at very small levels of stress there is a very large recoverable strain and mostly the stress strain relationship is non-linear. So, you see the stress strain relationship for rubber at very low levels of stress you have extremely high strains which can be recovered, but then it is non-linear the, the stress strain behavior is essentially non-linear. The other important characteristic is obviously the temperature behavior polymers exhibit two typical temperatures one is called a glass trans transition temperature and the other is a melting temperature. And because of this we also classify polymers into different types we call them thermosetting or thermoplastic polymers. Now a purely amorphous polymer will only exhibit glass transition temperature. A purely crystalline polymer will only exhibit melting temperature. Those polymers that have mixture of crystalline and amorphous phases will exhibit both these temperatures. So, again if you look at what happens to the specific volume, okay, what is specific volume is just the inverse of density. right? Density is mass by volume, specific volume is volume by mass as a variation of temperature. So, if you see for a glass or an amorphous material you have this transformation occurring at the glass transition temperature and beyond that the material becomes completely liquid. For a semi crystalline solid you have a transition occurring at the glass transition you also have a transition occurring at the melting temperature. For a crystalline solid there is no transformation at the tra glass transition or there is no glass transition temperature there is only a melting temperature for the crystalline material. Now, why is this important? We need to understand this because we need to define the range of working with these materials. Right? For a semi crystalline material obviously, for a well defined mechanical characteristic or mechanical response you would like to be in this region which is lower than the glass transition temperature because otherwise material will start becoming too viscoelastic for you to handle carefully. Okay? So, again because of this obviously, you have different types of performances exhibited you must have learned about thermoplastics and thermo setting. Thermo setting is essentially your cross linked and reticulated polymers whereas, thermoplastic means you are linear and branched which are easily able to move when temperatures increased. And what happens to thermoplastic materials when you have change in temperature and you test the mechanical response at 4 degrees you get something like this at 40 it is here at 60 it is here. So, you can see that there is a major drop in the ultimate stress levels when you increase the temperature. So, thermoplastic materials are extremely dependent 
on the temperature. And again why I wanted to say that you need to consider these characteristics is the extent of temperature is different for these different polymers. For example, if you consider PVC polyvinyl chloride, what is the common application of PVC? Pipes carrying water correct. So, it has a glass transition temperature of 87 degrees Celsius. What, what is the relevance of that? What significance is that? So, when we have extremely hot water, we do not want to use polyvinyl chloride. So, we do not want to use plastic pipes to carry extremely hot water. If you go to western countries, the water pipe systems are essentially lead systems for hot water, right? whereas they can still use plastic for normal water. In India, we only use plastic mostly, we do not get piped hot water. right? So, again we need to consider those things when we do a design of uh, components with these kind of materials. And again viscoelasticity is a primary characteristic as far as polymers are concerned. The rate of loading and temperature can have major effects on the performance of the material. With viscoelasticity you need to look at creep and relaxation and these two aspects also are very important from the point of view of testing polymers. Without going into the details, I think that level of emphasis is enough for uh, the purpose of this course. The primary idea was to understand that the internal structure of the material can have a major impact on how the processing is done and how the performance actually is obtained from these materials. Okay. So, overall you have seen that there are different types of materials used in construction, they have varied properties. The structures are complex and that makes characterization interesting but difficult. Okay. And they are the properties of the materials are affected to a large extent by the external environment and the testing conditions. So, again when you do characterization of these materials, you need to define the environment and testing conditions properly. Okay. So, just for example, when you read a research paper trying to figure out what has been done in the experiments, one of the main features that you need to pay particular attention to is what have been the conditions of testing and that obviously have a net impact on the result that is obtained in the investigation. So, that is very important to understand the actual methodology of testing because if you want to replicate the same test, you need to ensure that you are capturing the same conditions otherwise you will get completely different results. Okay. Very often we make that mistake of only looking at the problem and the result, the means is very important. In fact, in characterization you will see that the means is more important than the end or in some cases the means will actually describe the end. You will see that in many of the examples that we look into in this course. So, thank you all, uh, this session ends here. In the next session, Professor Piyush will start the uh, discussion on calorimetric techniques for cement hydration evaluation. Thank you.